so this chapter is about forces and just like with uh, chapters one through four which is about kinematics uh, chapter one kind of opened in a qualitative way and told you what all was coming in chapters two three and four and here chapter five is in a way giving you an overview of what all is coming in chapters six seven and eight so the very first thing that's here is a pretty nasty looking equation and it's equation 5.1 and it says that the sum i equals 1 to n of f sub i is an important combination and he's going to call that sum f net Now, for those of you that uh, aren't used to a lot of notation like this yet, you'll get used to it. Let's just understand what this says. This says that if you have some object, and for now our objects are going to be particles, this doesn't really work very well on extended objects, objects that are spinning, objects that are compressible, uh, it does work well on extended objects like a car, provided that you're moving the entire car in some direction. So for the moment here, let's imagine that we have a, something that we can model as a point. And we have some other things that are pressing on it in one way or another. So the object could be this bottle. And at the moment here, I am pressing on the bottom of the bottle. And the bottom of the bottle is actually pressing back on me. But the bottle is the thing I'm focusing on, not me. So think about what's acting on the bottle. There's me acting on the bottle. That's like uh, F Brian, comma, palm press. on bottle. Meanwhile, there's another mysterious force acting on this bottle. That's the actual gravity of Earth. And we don't understand the gravity of Earth yet, but I'll tell you, it creates a downward force on everything around it. So there's another force that's somehow getting all the particles of this object and is pulling in the downward direction. On this object. Now we have a special way of drawing that and the special way of drawing that whenever we have a point particle we draw it and then we draw all the forces on the particle with the tail of the force vector at the particle. So the where, even though my palm was pressing up on the bottom and it might seem kind of natural to put my palm press like that, the way we draw the diagrams, and this is a convention, the way we draw the diagram is we actually put Brian's palm press with its tail on the particle pointing in the direction that I was pressing. And Earth, which was pulling down on this thing, we point, put that force vector's tail on the object and we point it in the direction that it's pulling. So that's F of the Earth on the bottle. Okay, so this is an example where there are two forces. I could call this one instead of all these subscripts, F sub one, and I call, it, call this one, instead of all these subscripts, F sub two. And so in this equation up here, N is two. There's two forces acting on this particle. All this means then, this all this fancy notation means in this case is that F is F one plus F two. But in general, there might be a bunch more forces on this thing. We might have some wind resistance who knows, maybe somebody's also attached a spring to it. So if there are n things, 
which is the general case that there could be as many as you like all the way up to some number capital N. Then what this stands for is F1 plus F2 plus F3 plus dot 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 plus F sub N. So this is just a short way of writing that. And the really critical thing here from a physics standpoint is that all a particle cares about as far as its ultimate trajectory is what the total vectorial sum of all the forces are on it. It doesn't matter whether there's three forces that made F net or 15 forces that comprise together to make F net. You do the sum, you get the F net, and that is everything you need to know about the forces on that particle to determine what's going to happen to it. The next thing is, well, what does happen to it? And this is uh, now popping ahead all the way to section 5.5, five, where Knight says, well, the acceleration of a particle is what is related to F net. And so you take F net, and the more F net is, the more acceleration there will be in we can write that, we can say there's some proportionality constant here. The more F net on a particle, the more its acceleration will be. The other thing about a particle, though, is a particle has a mass. And an interesting thing is, is that A, whatever acceleration you get from this, is also proportional to, and remember I write my proportional to's on the whiteboard that way, A is proportional to, one over the mass. So whatever you get for the acceleration vector, if the particle had two kilograms of mass instead of having one kilogram of mass, then it would have half the acceleration. And in fact, that just says that since A is proportional to one over M, but A is also proportional to F net, that means that we can choose this proportionality constant to be one over M. Now you might go, well, why isn't there a conversion factor? Like why isn't there some additional conversion factor out here that after you take force and divide by mass, then maybe there's still some constant, uh, I could call it D, that gives you acceleration. Well, we choose the units of mass and we choose the units of force such that there is no additional constant in this formula. So acceleration is, 1 over m times f net, and you get f net just by vectorially adding up all the forces in a problem. We can multiply this equation through by m, and then we have that the total force on a particle is equal to ma. And that is probably, maybe other than E equals mc squared, the most famous equation in all of physics. And hopefully, you can read everything in chapter 5 up to 5.5. .5. That's it. Flip lecture 12.